Rocio is an environmental health specialist too, training officer, and foodborne illness investigator for the Pima County Health Department. She graduated from the University of Arizona with a Bachelor's of Science in Nutritional Sciences and a minor in Biochemistry. She is a member of the Consumer Health and Food Safety e-newsletter team, a grant writer, and lead member of the Foodborne Illness Outbreak Response Team. Good afternoon, everyone. This outbreak investigation and presentation was created in partnership with Lauren Denor. We represent Consumer Health and Food Safety Division of the Pima County Health Department. The name of this presentation is Preventing Foodborne Illness Outbreaks with Effective Hygiene, Cleaning and Sanitation Practices. At the end of this module, you will be able to describe the steps involved in environmental sample collection and the value of its use to identify areas contaminated with salmonella, demonstrate knowledge and ability to draw scientifically based conclusions from environmental assessments and routine food inspections data to identify risk factors. Demonstrate an understanding of the stone concept to identify the harborage niche where salmonella could survive before sample collection begins. In May 2021, ADHS Arizona Department of Health Services notified Pima County Health Department about a salmonella brand wrap cluster. After the initial investigation by the state and local epidemiologists, Consumer Health and Food Safety Division was alerted about the premises where the suspect food was prepared and or handled. Environmental investigations and collection of environmental samples were conducted in parallel with epidemiological and laboratory analysis to find out how and why the outbreak occurred. And most importantly, to institute corrective actions to avoid similar occurrences in the future. Effective communication between investigative partners was fundamental throughout the course of the outbreak investigation. The objective of effective communication during an outbreak is to ensure accurate case findings and to facilitate the implementation of control measures. Communication channels and regular meetings should be used as the most efficient means of keeping authorities and other professional groups fully informed. Early communication ensures that all steps in a foodborne illness outbreak investigation are conducted in a timely manner. A successful investigation requires a teamwork approach and collaboration with investigative partners. As a local health department working with a DHS enable us to implement a coordinated investigation to move quickly and accurately. We started by developing a plan of action, specifically identifying series of actions intended to identify and resolve the foodborne outbreak. Once it was determined that it was necessary to collect environmental samples, to detect the presence of Salmonella Brandrup, a potential serious public health risk, we develop a sampling team identifying roles and responsibilities. The 
According to the Environmental Protection Agency, when collecting large-scale samples containing pathogens, a sampling team consisting of three individuals is recommended. As a collector, I handle the sample collection devices to swab and collect the sample. Lauren was the supplier. The supplier provides the collector with the devices needed to collect the sample, assist the collector bagging the sample to maintain sample integrity, and keeps, tracks, keeps track of samples and their pertaining sites. We were fortunate to have had the support of our state and local epidemiologists as our support person at different instances of the environmental sample collection. The support person took pictures, assisted the collector opening, closing, or moving food equipment to prevent cross-contamination between sample areas and the sample collection device. Taking pictures of the areas was extremely important as it helped with record keeping and pictures of the areas where positive results were found provided a broad overview of data analytics attributed to contributing factors. This team approach can definitely, re definitely reduce the time required for sample collection and adds an additional layer of quality assurance. We use epidemiological data generated from interviews of individuals that became ill. Restaurants A and B were both originally identified as potential locations for the outbreak source. The investigation started by reviewing records of each facility to learn if they have had a history of complaints or to become familiar with their past food safety inspection ratings. Immediately after the food safety inspection and an environmental assessment was conducted at each facility. About a week later, environmental sampling was conducted at both facilities. Environmental sampling results indicated no presence of salmonella bacteria in restaurant B. Therefore, restaurant B was eliminated as a potential location of the outbreak. For the purposes of this presentation, based on the sampling results, we will only be discussing details related to restaurant A. Preparation for our initial site visit to restaurant A, we reviewed the previous inspection history and analyzed the line list provided by the Epidemi Epidemiolo Epidemiology Division. Excuse me. A detailed review of the facility previous inspection history indicated that cooling methods and thermometer accessibility were out of compliance in the recent past. The fact that eggs were consumed by the majority of those who became ill and were diagnosed with salmonella was helpful information for determining workstation areas of interest. At this point in time, it was decided to pay close attention to the egg station and all of the processes and preparations, including employee hygiene and contamination of food and food equipment. The following CDC foodborne illness risk factors were observed out of compliance one or more times during the routine inspection. 
hand washing regarding when to wash hands, how to wash hands, and bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. Cross contamination involving raw animal products stored above exposed ready to eat foods. Insufficient cleaning and sanitizing processes and procedures. Both of the makeup units on the cook line were holding TCS foods at temperatures above 41 degrees Fahrenheit. The main cold holding equipment on the cook line was not maintaining TCS foods at safe temperatures. Corrective actions of each violation was requested. Education was provided to the person in charge and was instructed to properly clean and sanitize all food contact surfaces and equipment. The X station was the most consistently busy station on the cook line and had the high, highest dynamic risk. This was due to the X station employee switching between handling raw and ready to eat foods, sometimes multiple times per order. Hand washing did not occur when required. The egg station employee was observed removing raw and pasteurized eggs from the shell, then handling ready to eat cheese without washing hands and without changing gloves. In addition, when hand washing occurred, the employee washed hands for only five seconds and no friction was created between hands before soap was rinsed. Also, the employee primarily responsible for removing soil food plates from the tables was observed serving a slice of apple pie with bare hands. When asked about the frequency of cleaning food preparation equipment held on the cook line at room temperature used to prepare TCS foods throughout the shift, the person in charge or PAC stated that the equipment, including cutting boards on the cook line, were cleaned daily, but not cleaned and sanitized at a required cleaning and sanitation frequency of at least every four hours when held at room temperature. The person in charge also stated that prepping tables used for the preparation of raw animal products were wiped down with bleach, but not soap or rinsing was applied prior using bleach. The PAC was very confident about their cleaning procedures as they believe that bleach killed everything. During the food safety inspection, we observed improper cleaning and sanitation procedures throughout all areas of the restaurant, including inadequate chlorine sanitizer concentration in the dishwasher machine. The concentration of the sanitizer solution was observed at about 10 parts per million. The person in charge was not able to make the necessary adjustments to increase the sanitizer's concentration somewhere between 50 and 100 parts per million. As a result, the PAC was instructed to use a three compartment sink to properly, properly wash, win, rinse, and sanitize all food equipment that was previously run in the dishwasher machine. Employee knowledge of proper use of the three compartment sink procedures was insufficient since the employee did not know how much sanitizer to use and the sanitizer's contact time with food equipment. The deli slicer stored as clean had old encrusted food debris at the top of the blade 
and large amounts of buildup on portions of the slicer. The facility struggle at multiple site visits to properly clean the deli slicer. Furthermore, the person in, ch in charge stated that the deli slicer was impossible to clean. There were no standard operational procedures to clean the deli slicer. For this reason, the person in charge was provided with an, with an electronic version of the operation manual for the slicer. The PAC was informed that deli slicers had been associated with foodborne illness outbreaks with a buildup of food soils and disease causing microorganisms on areas of deli slicers that are difficult to clean and sanitize. The person in charge was instructed to careful monitor the cleanliness of the deli slicer and to follow the clean and sanitize deli slicer manufacturer's instructions. Make top unit two on the cook line had raw animal foods such as chorizo stored above exposed ready to eat foods and clean plates used for sandwiches. The equipment did not have any separation or partition between the raw chorizo and the ready to eat foods and clean plates stored below. Raw chorizo was also stored above open and exposed vegetables in the walk-in refrigerator. Cold holding of foods that require refrigeration to inhibit microbial growth, also referred as the temperature control for food safety TCS food, was observed out of compliance in the two main cold holding units on the cook line. Raw shelled eggs pallets stored at ambient during the routine inspection were observed cold holding at 63, 63 degrees Fahrenheit. At additional site visits, upwards of four or five egg pallets were observed stored at ambient temperature. That is approximately 72 raw shell eggs undergoing consistent temperature abuse. According to the CDC, the top risk factors that contribute to a foodborne illness include improper hot and cold holding temperatures of potentially hazardous foods, improper cooking temperatures, dirty or contaminated utensils and equipment, poor employee health and hygiene, and food from unsafe sources. On the right, we listed three of the five risk factors observed out of compliance. First, under contaminated utensils and equipment, the restaurant had improper cleaning and sanitation procedures. Dirty equipment stored as clean and improper sanitizer levels in the dishwasher machine. Second, under the poor employee health and hygiene, we observed improper hand washing, bare hand contact with ready to eat food, and the restaurant did not have any written employee health policy. Last but not least, cold holding was out of compliance. An environmental assessment was also conducted. An environmental assessment is a science-based evaluation that identifies contributing factors, or in other words, food preparation practices that led to food getting contaminated with bacteria or that led to bacteria growing in food. An environmental assessment specifically reconstructs past events that may have contributed to the outbreak. The goal is to find clues and sufficient data 
to develop a hypothesis regarding the cause of the outbreak and to implement appropriate control measures to prevent future outbreaks. Information was gathered through a series of interview questions specific to salmonella control, control measures and observations. The interview questions of the environmental assessment focus on specific control measures for salmonella. Some of the questions asked to the owner were, from where or what company do you get eggs from? Does anybody bring eggs from their house or farm? Where are the eggs stored and to what temperatures are they received? Where do you purchase produce? Has the restaurant experienced water or electrical outage? Do any of the employees work at different restaurants or grocery stores? Do employees use thermometers to, che to check food temperatures? Do you make peanut butter? Are employees allowed to bring their pets, their pets in the facility? Do you know if any employees own turtles or reptiles? A control measure is defined as any action and activity that can be used to prevent or eliminate a food safety hazard or reduce it to an acceptable level. According to the World Health Organization, the specific control measures to prevent salmonella include safe food preparation practices, adequate cooking and reheating temperatures, adequate refrigeration, prevention of cross-contamination, proper cleaning and sanitation procedures, exclusion of pets and other animals from food handling areas. From the interviews with food handlers and the owner, we concluded the following. Lack of proper cleaning and sanitation procedures. Lack of written employee illness procedures. And thermometers were not used to check food temperatures. A very important aspect of the investigation was to analyze the food flow from receipt of ingredients through disposition of the final product as it provides a roadmap for the environmental assessment. Determining the flow starting at the receiving door through storage, preparation, cooking, assembly, hot holding, and ending with the customer is critical as contamination of ready-to-eat foods can occur with poor food flow. The work table on this picture shows a mounted deli slicer, a stand mixer, and a variety of dry food products above and below the table, clearly showing that multiple food processes take place on this specific table. After asking questions to the owner about the work table, we found that this was the main work table used to prep raw poultry and pies using unpasteurized shelled eggs. However, raw animal protein foods were prepped at any other of their three work tables. The restaurant did not have a specific work table assigned for prepping raw animal products. It was reported by the owner the raw poultry was only prepared after closing hours by management only. Nevertheless, the possibility of cross-contamination between raw animal protein residue with ready-to-eat food or with equipment stored as clean was substantially high 
due to the poor layout, which entails having mounted food equipment on prepping tables where employees work with raw animal product, and the lack of proper cleaning and sanitation procedures. When reviewing the menu, it is important to evaluate the flow patterns for the preparation of the food to be sure that the layout of the facility provides an adequate separation of raw ingredients from ready to eat foods and that the traffic patterns are not crossing paths with waste items and other sources of contamination. In addition, reviewing the menu helped us identify high risk foods such as raw unpasteurized eggs and raw poultry. Equipment used for high risk foods can transfer bacteria from one food product to another if they're not adequately clean and sanitized. Also, if food equipment it's, it's not maintained in good repair. Pathogens can hide in cracks or crevices and then contaminate foods. Another important aspect of the investigation was to evaluate the maintenance of food equipment. If food equipment is not maintained in good repair, Pathogens can hide in cracks or crevices and then contaminate foods. Six days after the food safety routine inspection and the environmental, environmental assessment and after the person in charge was told to properly clean and sanitize food contact surfaces and equipment, we collected our first environmental samples. Based on the findings from the routine food inspection, the environmental assessment, and the highest risk areas where Salmonella may thrive, the FBI team, for born illness team, selected specific zones for sampling. When it comes to choosing areas to sample, it's all about location, location, location. It is critical to find areas and food equipment that are difficult to clean, such as cracks and crevices where pathogens can hide and thrive. This is where you are more likely to find pathogens as opposed to the more easily clean flat surfaces. The zoning concept was utilized as it provides valuable data on the source and concentration on specific organisms. We sample zone one and zone two. Zone one refers to all direct food contact surfaces, such as deli slicers, cutting boards, uh, racks, work tables, etc. Zone two includes all non-food contact surfaces, such as exterior of equipment, specifically areas that are difficult to reach and clean, including cracks and crevices where product residue accumulates. We use pre-moist stick sponges as our collection device to collect environmental samples. The size of the area sample was about 12 inches high by 12 inches wide, and both sides of the sponge was used. The use of these sponges offer the advantage of greater surface area to be tested and may therefore be more useful in testing surfaces for pathogens. After inoculation, the sponge was placed in a sterile bag and transported to the Arizona State Public Health Laboratory.
Pre-moist sponges before and after use must be kept refrigerated. It is suggested to maintain them at a temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep swabs in ice chests or foam coolers with ice packs after collection and during transportation. It is critical to keep track of time since samples had to be cult cultivated in the lab within 36 hours after collection. In the state of Arizona, we do not collect samples unless chain of custody is established. Chain of custody is the process by which a authorized custody of a sample is successively transferred from one person to another by the use of approved procedures and documents. The chain of custody is located in the bottom portion of the microbiology food analysis. This form is extremely important for establishing that sample integrity was maintained from time of collection through the time of analysis. We collected environmental samples from direct food contact surfaces, such as deli slicers and cutting boards and from non-food contact surfaces, such as exterior of equipment. Three days after sample collection, we received preliminary results that indicated the presence of salmonella DNA without the serotype. 31% of the samples collected tested positive for salmonella. The green marks on the kitchen floor plan show all areas where food equipment was contaminated with salmonella. Contamination was primarily located near the X station across, exactly across from the wear washing station. When collecting environmental samples, ensure that they're properly collected, labeled, adequately stored and transported, and employ good record keeping. Positive results were disclosed to the owner the following day during the routine follow-up inspection. During the routine follow-up inspection, Lauren and another EHS provided educational materials, observed the implementation of corrective actions, and communicated general areas of concern based on sampling results to the owner. After informing the person in charge of the sampling results, we provided copies of photos where samples were taken from and a list of affected areas. We reviewed clean in place cleaning and sanitizing procedures specific for salmonella disinfection and informed the person of, in charge that the entire facility should be deeply cleaned and sanitized. The person in charge implemented a four-step cleaning procedure. That is, step one, wash using soap and hot water of 110 Fahrenheit or follow detergent manufacturer label. Step two, rinse. Step three, disinfect surfaces by using a one-third cup of bleach per gallon of water. The person in charge was educated on the fact that the solution must remain on the surface for 10 minutes in order to ensure efficacy. 
The solution prepare method was based on the label information of the bleach bottle on hand at the facility for salmonella disinfection. We recommend that the facility, we recommended that the facility do an initial first application of the solution and second application after five minutes to ensure surface remains in contact with the disinfectant for a full 10 minutes. Step four, after this disinfection, employees did a sanitizer post rinse of food contact surfaces with food safe concentration of one tablespoon of bleach per gallon of water. Reapplied on surfaces and allowed to air dry. We reviewed the cleaning procedures and observed employees clean. Some of the suggestions made at the time was to obtain small brushes to clean hard to reach areas of the deli slicer. We did not disclose to the person in charge that additional site visits and additional sampling may occur. We did discuss about the importance of ensuring that the restaurant is properly clean and sanitized. The person in charge was instructed to remove or pull out equipment to prevent the accumulation of pathogenic microorganisms and prevent contamination. During the follow-up inspection, we noticed the following corrective actions. The food preparation table that was located near the walk-in refrigerator and used for multiple processes was designated specifically for cutting and the preparation of raw animal product. Recommended the PAC to relocate the flour and sugar bins that would store under the table during the preparation of raw animal products to prevent any possibility of cross-contamination of ready-to-eat foods. The employee reporting agreement, agreement form 1B was provided to all employees. Signatures were collected and the owner added an employee policy to the written procedures. The owner was in disbelief. He was frustrated and upset about the foodborne illness outbreaks, especially when all of his employees eat food from the restaurant and they had never been sick. We, we took the time to listen to the owner's concerns, provided education, and reminded him that our primary goal was to work together as a team to keep their customers safe. Days after receiving the preliminary results, the state lab confirmed that the samples match the clinical samples taken from patients diagnosed from Salmonella Brandrap. As a result, it was decided to collect more environmental samples, primarily to ensure that Salmonella Brandrap was eliminated after employees clean and sanitize the restaurant. The results from the second environmental sample collection indicated that Salmonella brown wrap was not eliminated as 40% of the samples were positive, including areas where positive where employees had already cleaned and sanitized. In, res in response to the contamination, we return back to the restaurant. This closed the positive results with the owner, issued an imminent health hazard and a temporary closure. Furthermore, we physically demonstrated and educated employees how to properly clean and sanitize once again. 
the remediation company was able to provide treatment the same day of closure, and as a result, the restaurant was able to reopen the following day. Part of the resolution included for the owner to find environmental testing company of his choice and to submit results of all the areas that tested positive for salmonella, such as the egg prepping table, microwave, walk-in handle, egg prepping table, deli slicer, expo table, and toasters, in addition to other areas of the entire restaurant to prove whether salmonella was removed or not. Days later, the owner provided a copy of the negative lab test results, concluding that salmonella was destroyed from the restaurant after the bioremediation company provided treatment. This timeline indicates all the important events that took place during the investigation. The boxes located above the timeline account for the times we were present at the restaurant. In the span of a little over a month, we visited the restaurant a total of five times. The boxes located below the timeline account for the days it took to receive lab results. Five months after closure, we were notified by ADHS about, about a new cluster of salmonella brown drop, highly related to the strain that caused the outbreak earlier that year. Immediately, the epidemiology uh, team conducted phone interviews. The state lab sent us 50 stick sponges and we collected environmental samples. During this environmental sample collection, we found layers of biofilm in the dishwashing machine and behind loose base coving from the ware washing station. Biofilm is a substance produced by bacteria that covers them and protects them from harm. The presence of biofilms in food equipment puts human health at risk as biofilm can withstand higher temperatures, cleaning and commonly used disinfectants. Forty-four percent of the area sample tested positive for salmonella. The green star-like symbols represent areas with the presence of salmonella. The red star-like symbol represents the presence of biofilm. Interestingly, the biofilm location was near equipment with the greatest concentrations of salmonella positive surfaces. Given the location and that biofilm was found in the wear washing area, specifically inside the low temperature dishwasher machine, we concluded that this may have been the breeding ground for salmonella. The owner voluntarily closed and remained closed for two weeks until negative lab test results were obtained. We now know, based on our sampling results, that Salmonella was able to survive in a dishwashing machine, likely because of the biofilm formation. Biofilms can withstand higher temperatures, standard cleaning procedures, and can become resistant to commonly used disinfectants. With that being said, all food equipment that was placed in the dishwasher machine for the purposes of getting clean and sanitized 
was exposed to salmonella and the biofilm protecting salmonella. Soil and improperly cleaned and sanitized equipment, such as the dishwasher machine, can become a source of contamination. A dishwasher machine has many crevices, which are extremely difficult to clean even when the machine was dismantled, as you can see from the pictures um, in this slide. The picture furthest to the right shows the dishwasher machine motor covered in biofilm buildup. We have the privilege to safely witness the bioremediation process the second time around and work with them collaboratively in order to identify areas of concern. These are photos of the remediation process using foggers and electrostatic sprayers containing the disinfectant. The photo on the right is Part is it's where the wear washing area is located, uh, where the base coving was removed. The three compartment sink, the dishwasher machine, base coving, and FRP panels were removed. In the first picture, you can see the bioremediation employees helping the owners remove wall panels and base coping. Even after the dishwasher was dismantled, it was very difficult to re reach crevices within the machine to properly clean and remove the accumulation of biofilm. For this reason, reason the dishwasher machine was replaced with a new dishwasher machine. The three compartment sink was scrubbed and treated with chemicals and new piping was provided. Once the FRP panels were removed from the wall, the exposed wall was treated. New FRP panels and new base coving was provided and properly sealed to the wall to prevent future problems. Lauren can be seen assessing the situation on the middle picture and farthest to the right. This is a close-up of the biofilm formation behind the wear washing machine and the wall and floor juncture. The biofilm had to be scraped with a brush containing steel bristles after the coving was pulled away from the wall. This table provides information of all the environmental sample collections. The first column pertains to the collection on May 24th, 2021, where 30, 31% of the surfaces sample positive, were positive for salmonella. Salmonella was found in the daily slicer, multiple prepping tables, cutting board at the egg station, egg station make top, microwave handles, walk-in handle, and the bottom portion of the egg prepping table. The second column per pertains to the second collection conducted on June 10th, 2021, where 40% of the samples collected tested positive for salmonella. The third column pertains to the third collection gathered by the owners of the restaurant conducted on June 23, 2021, where 0% of the surfaces were negative for salmonella. The fourth column pertains to the collection 
conducted on November 3rd, 2021, where 44% of the surfaces sampled tested positive for salmonella. And finally, the last collection on November 15, 2021, where 0% were negative. And this salmonella case has been closed uh, since then. It was important to establish prevention measures prior reopening the restaurant to prevent the reemergence of salmonella brown drop. Food equipment with cracks and crevices and no longer smooth to properly clean and disinfect was discarded. Door gaskets in this repair were replaced. Wiping cloths were replaced and disposable paper towels were used instead of wiping cloths. Light intensity in the kitchen was intensified. According to the owner of the facility, this foodborne illness outbreak cost them about $80,000. Ultimately, the facility, facility voluntarily implemented a risk control plan to address foodborne illness risk factors, consistently observed out of compliance increased routine inspection frequency for one year. In addition, additional sampling was collected as a final control measure. Samples were sent to couple laboratories. This allowed our division to ensure that accurate results were provided to ensure a successful conclusion of the outbreak. And this worked as a type of control measure as well. Many changes were implemented in order to prevent another salmonella outbreak. Stringent cleaning and sanitation protocols, preventative maintenance and care of equipment, continuous education, implementation of active managerial control done or created by designated employees on site. At the start of the outbreak investigation, the owner was very frustrated, confused, upset, and felt that the health department just wanted them to close. When these emotions arise, it is vital to remain calm, to be empathetic, and to apply outstanding listening skills. Lauren and I physically demonstrated and assisted with cleaning procedures on site numerous occasions. This action helped us attain trust with the owners as it demonstrated that we cared and wanted to help. The owner, operator, and the inspector relationships improved over time. The owner even stated, I don't feel threatened by the health department anymore. I feel like you guys are here, are here to help me. And at the end of this outbreak, the owner was very grateful for the assistance, education, and or dedication. I would like to acknowledge Connor Fitzgerald and Dr. Jolie from ADHS, Arizona State Public Health Laboratory, and Gretchen Peterson and Anissa Taylor from the epidemiolo epidemiology team from Pima County Health Department and everyone else that was involved during this investigation. These are uh, resources that we used. 
If you would like to reach out to me, Lauren, or Program Manager Amanda Anderson, or our Division Manager Lonnie Anderson, our emails are listed in this slide. Thank you very much for your time. That was a very informative presentation and lots of good knowledge bits for um, us inspectors that are out in the field. Um, so Rocio is here with us today virtually um, in the chat. She's only able to answer questions though through the chat. Um, so if you do have any questions, just put those in and she'll be able to type out her response to those. Yeah. <laughs> 